Okay, I think we're okay. close enough. Step back a little, little bit more. I'm gonna get more light on. Ah, there you go. There's that that Rick thing that okay. I've been doing. All right, okay. All right, let's go. All right. Thirty. Are you? Let us know when you're rolling. I'm rolling. All right, thirty-four point one. Okay, so Lance, you've been uh, focus grouping basically it's informally our project here. People don't like the little short sessions that run eight or ten or eleven minutes. So uh, we will, when we start rolling out more stuff, where we've got a twenty-one minute one ready to come out and a seventeen minute. Though it's a pain in the getting stuff on YouTube is not. Just you shoot it and then you squirt it onto YouTube. It's like a four-step process, at least. And it, every process takes a chunk of time. So anyway, we're going to have longer segments now because you don't have to keep clicking and finding the, as many next ones. You'll get 20 minutes at a time. We also want to hear, though, if, if that's... Uh, this is... I'm... What's my name? Uh, we want to hear... Yeah, we want to hear from the uh, from our members if 20 minutes is too long. If you like the 10-minute segments, please comment and let us know you prefer the smaller segments. Right, Rick? Yeah, yeah. You like them 10 minutes? You like them 20 minutes? Let's what just start a poll. Let's just, uh, why don't we ask for a poll now? Real scientific right. poll, not just a bad Just put it right in the comments. Say, is this the right link? Yeah, and wait. There's one more thing. I have been... Uh, for Number one, I... I never liked the idea of eight minute segments. And number two, I never liked the idea of 27.1, 27.2, 27.3. I always thought we should just have 27, 28, 29, 30. And what Camille, the director, has told me is that it's really hard just to do 29, 20, 30, 31, 32. Well, it's apparently much easier and less expensive to cut it into 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Well, the deal is you listen to podcasts all day. No, it's, it's because I've been told and I suspect and I've experienced that once you listen to 27.1, it's really hard to find 27.2. Everything's as eventually when I get to it, and I think everything that we have up now is installed in a playlist so you can see everything we have under a particular session if you look for the playlist for that session. Um, I'm a novice at doing this stuff on wait, YouTube and wait, too. And but, the other thing is this, people don't even know how many points there are. Well, we, there I could can, be point one, point two, point three, point five, point seven, point eight. They don't even know. But if you go to the playlists, it, it lists every session that we have posted so far on that session. For instance, yeah. the Chelsea sessions, we have sessions like 26.4 through 26.8 up, and that implies that there are three we haven't thrown up there yet. Exactly, that's my point. Yeah, but, but it, it, it's, it's not, a, a, you can't, it's not magical to post frickin', it should, it seems like it should be magical to get stuff on, up on YouTube, but it's a, it's a multi-step process. You gotta, you got to download it here. You got to turn it into a JPEG or some other crap. You got to condense it. You got to quick time movie it. You that's, gotta, that's fine. But why yeah. would it be easier to do 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 than to just say 28, 29, 30, 31? Well, for one thing, YouTube was initially set up for people initially were used to shorter videos. You listen to podcasts, and podcasts run a half hour or an hour, but YouTube stuff generally runs shorter. Also, it's just that, for example, what session is this for? 34. So everything that's in session 34 is going to be under the 34.1. Everything you hear, it will be 34.1. It could be technically up to 34.8 you know, or whatever. And, and that way we have a... The next time we meet, it'll be session 35. That's the rationale for doing like doing it that way. Otherwise, then we, I think it could get even more confusing where, let's say the first part of the session is, is 35.1, right, Rick? Right? Yeah, yeah. So then now the next second well, part no, this of the is session is going to be 36, yeah. then the third part is going to be 37. Yeah, yeah well, we, we're not going to change labeling things in the middle of the deal. But, but just, sorry, bear with us. This is a, a guerrilla operation. 
I don't even know if this is 31 or 31.1. This is 34.1. So is this 34 e zero or 34.1? Everything starts with 0.1. Okay. But, uh, okay, fine. Now right. let's get to the meat because people right. don't like this process. Stuff. All right, anyway. So all three of us have seen The Disaster Artist, which is James Franco's... All four of us. Okay, yeah. All right. It's James Franco's movie about the making of the worst movie ever made, which is The Room, in some people's minds. Have you ever seen The Room? I've seen like a half an hour of it. Is it really that? It, 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 it it's weirdly bad, yeah. Um, and it, in some ways, that project reminded uh, me of us. Except that, you know, the room guy, Tommy Wiseau, um, had no technical expertise or knowledge, um, didn't have a lot of talent, or misunderstood his talent, <laughs> such as it was or is. Um, you know, he look, he's a creepy guy with a weird foreign accent, and he cast himself as an all-American leading man. So he was fundamentally kind of misguided. What he had was a bunch of money to make this terrible movie and the willingness to do it. And the three of us have the willingness to make a project and we actually have some talent, but um, it remains to be seen whether you know that talent comes to any kind of you know, rewarding fruition. None of us is in his 20s or even 30s any, anymore. Uh, in his or her 20s or 30s anymore. We are, we are middle-aged individuals. But we still have hopes and dreams. Um, mine are slightly deranged, yet not unreasonable. Here, I'll talk about mine first. Um, I have a theory of the universe that says that the universe is information-based, that an information-based universe looks like a Big Bang universe, but the apparent age of the universe, which is the, the apparent amount of time since the Big Bang, um, is, actually, is proportionate to the amount of information the universe contains, but that the universe is actually just tremendously older than its apparent age. Um, Can you say bang now? Bang? Why, why do you, you think, say bang? Yeah, why do you think it. that, by the way, Rick? Well, because it, it, it makes sense. It's, it's stuff I've been thinking about for, not that this is any, you know, I mean, I, I could have been thinking dumb stuff for the past yeah, but I, I, 35. I'm just, I'm just curious as to what moment, what, what was it that where, you know, our whole lives we've been hearing the universe is 14 billion? 13 eight, yeah. Okay, and, and one day you sat back and said... When I was just before my 21st... God, it just can't be 14 no. billion. No, it's no, gotta no. be older than that. Or, no. I, I, you know, so, did an apple fall on your head? No, I was think? eating red jello in the Libby Hall cafeteria at the University of Colorado in April 1981 and I was thinking about short-term memory versus long-term memory. And the, you know, the brain has different means of, or different strategies for different, you know, for short-term versus long-term. And I was, I'd read an article about it. And, um, but I was also thinking that, you know, short-term versus long-term could be a matter of geometry that um, short-term memories are immediately accessible because via context, you're still in the context um, that you were in when you formed the memory. Somebody gives you their phone number at a party and you're still at the party and you, if somebody said, you know, 937-4219, um, then you should be that should stick in your head 
long enough, you know, if you review it enough or long enough for you to find a piece of paper, 9374219. But if you don't write it down or if you don't make a special effort to memorize it, when you're away from the party, um, the number's gone. And short-term memories don't last. Um, it's a story of my life. Yeah. But long-term... It's story, story of my love life. Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> long-term memories tend to be accessible via a, a, a number of different contexts. Um, you know, uh, when you lost your virginity, your, 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 your favorite teacher, um, you know, the, uh, your mom's hairdo. Uh, you have plenty of memories um, and plenty of contexts with which to go after that, those, the, the long-term memories that are accessible. And sometimes you'll, you'll find a, a long-term memory that you haven't accessed in a while because you, uh, an odd context comes up that enables you to recall that, that long-term, that memory from long ago. So anyway, it seems like there's a geometry that um, easily recallable memories are more central. There, you, can, you have more angles under which you can come at a long-term memory and find it in more ways than you, an, an easily accessible memory than a less accessible memory. And that suggests a geometry of, of information in the brain, which suggests, I was, then you, if, if, if it suggests a geometry, then you have to picture what the geometry might be with more accessible information, more at the center, and less accessible information more off to the side and harder to get at. And then I have the thought over red jello, um, maybe the universe is that map. Maybe the most efficient map of, of, of information stored within an individual awareness or is, looks like what the universe looks like, has the same geometry. And that's what's been you know, propelling my thinking about this stuff for the past you know, 36 years. I'm really sorry I asked. Yeah, so anyway. So I would love to get that theory. And, but I, the, 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 my hopes and dreams are, are, you have, well tell your hopes and dreams, we'll come back, because there's, there's, there's some stuff that is the same and some stuff that's different between wanting to do something in physics and wanting to do something in pain. Okay, so what uh, my hope and dream is I'd like to be able to make a living doing art, uh, which has eluded me up till now. Uh, I just do odd jobs to get by, but um, which isn't much to ask for, you know? And the other thing I wanted to do was larger work. So if you look at my website and you look at uh, what I've accomplished, most of my, oh, LanceRichland.com. Uh, but most of my work is, is individual figures. And you can tell a, bit, a more interesting story if you have more figures. And it, it makes for a more ambitious painting. So I'd like to do large work with more figures and tell more stories. Uh, but I have never had the money to hire the models or buy the canvases. So uh, I'm pretty limited in what I can do. I even would like to do a, a full figure marble, but I haven't had the money to take off a year or two that it a would require. A full figure marble stone sculpture a life size yeah, cause i've done i've done a couple of heads in marble but it's a lot easier than a full figure and the truth is it's, it's not beyond my ability i mean there are you know back in the in the old days there were guys not even the old days like in the early 
you know, in the in the 1940s, there were guys that could crank out a, a full-size figure when they were in their 20s. But uh, I haven't been able to, and I'm in my 50s. So uh, I've been, weirdly enough, becoming an artist, but a, a basically poverty-stricken artist has prevented me from accomplishing the actual art. So it's sort of a, an, it's ironic that you sacrifice everything to do your art, but then you can't do your art. You also want to be recognized as one of the world's foremost realist painters. Well, I don't, here's the funny thing about recognition for an artist. I don't care if I'm recognized, I just need the money. And no one gives you the money unless they recognize you. So it's sort of like, it, it's a catch-22. People think, oh, you just want to be famous. And, and as they say, if you're not famous, it's like being a, it's like being an actor that's not famous. Well, you know, he's not going to get the opportunity to do roles. And so he can't be an actor. You have to be famous to get the jobs. And you have to be famous, you have to have some kind of recognition or no one will buy the painting so that you can get the money to pay your rent. And if the deal is... Quick, if you had 10 artists of Lance in a room, just, just to, to give us a, a, a picture of, of how many artists actually make money, of those 10, how many would be poverty stricken in your estimation? All of them. You'd, so you'd, have, money? you'd have to go to a field of 100 artists to find two or three that are surviving. It's a dying art. It's, it's not, uh, it's, it's, the people don't buy oil paintings anymore. So we live in an era where, when I was young and I went into this field, people bought oil paintings. Uh, and gradually people got more interested in other forms of entertainment or other forms of you know, enrichment, and they stop buying art. So it's a, it's a dying field. But with regard to what you want to do, yes. it's obvious that you're good at this stuff. If you look at this thing, and if, if you want to pan around and show some other stuff. Well, I'd have to turn the lights on. Don't, I mean, the place is a mess. It's, yeah, I, you can look at my website, I'm definitely, I, I, was, I was included in a book of the best, the 20 best artists, of, best realist artists of the 21st century by an, an impartial judge. So um, I'm, I'm, at the very least, I'm, I'm good at this. You know, how good is, is no one will ever know, but uh, you know, if, if, if someone deserves to be able to make oil paintings, I've, I've paid my dues. Who taught you? Who taught me? Yeah. Um, the method I'm using is kind of self-taught because a lot of the skills died out as well. It's, it's a funny field because for a long time we thought it was going to die out because uh, so few people did it. And now it's going to die out because even though there are people that know how to do it, uh, people aren't buying it. So it's, 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 it's continuously dying for one reason or another. So you can teach yourself by reading about it and then by looking at paintings and seeing how the brush strokes are structured? And... Um, well, we're going on and on about Lance, and yeah, I kind of well, cut come you back. down, but I, I kind of cut off your physics thing. Well, the, the deal is, like, if you don't do your paintings, they won't get done. They won't exist in the world. The, the massive paintings, the ones that are right, that would right, be 20 right, feet right, wide by 8 feet tall right, with I, 8 the, figures. Which always, which, uh, by the way, most artists go crazy on that one too. Like I've noticed that the handful of realists out there that are ambitious these days all try to do something like that. Because they want to do what the old masters did, you know, the real grand projects. And they all pretty much dash themselves upon the rocks trying to do that. So, but the difference between what you want to do and what I want to do is physics gets done, even if I don't get to do it. Okay. Like, there's a feeling, there, there's a, 
it, it, it's a common sentiment in physics is that even if Einstein had gotten hit by a bus when he was 19, you would still have both the relativities. It would have taken a while longer, uh, but you would have had special relativity. And you mean you're saying someone would have figured it out? Well, because the world, the physics is embodied in the world. It, it, it's no, but, but, but what I'm saying is it, gravity always exists too, but you're saying there would be a human that would discover it. Well, yeah, because you, somebody would eventually figure it out. There was a guy, Henri Poincaré, who was a candidate for, you know, if, if Einstein hadn't lived, he might have discovered, like, a lot of special relative. People were poking at it. Okay. And I think, what I think about physics will eventually be officially discovered. The, the, you know, the Big Bang theories, according... I can say bang. In a, in a non-Harvey Weinsteinian sense, um, uh, it, uh, it, the theories such as big theories like the Big Bang, even smaller theories, they go for a long time. And the Big Bang, as being the official number one theory, is about 50 years old. And it's accumulated a lot of little glitchy things that don't necessarily agree, and the theories had to be, has to be modified. And according to one, is it, uh, is, who's it, Popper or Kuhn, this, the theory of scientific revolutions, theories go until they accumulate so much baggage that somebody, is, people think, well, maybe this theory isn't the one and we can come up with a better theory that, that accounts, you know, the, that you don't need to make all these special allowances for the baggage. And what's happening with Big Bang theory is... The Alvarez with the Big Bang theory? He was something. He was, I don't know, he was Manhattan Project, wasn't he? To oh, some extent. I don't know. I mean, he probably, all those guys did, almost a lot of guys got sucked into Manhattan Project, who also worked on, you know, other. Um, wait, is Alvarez the, one of those guys is the, uh, is the meteor that killed the, the dinosaurs in 65 million years ago. Um, anyway, um, that's all right. So what, I think what you're going to see is that there are going to be more and more celestial objects, quasars and such, that um, they're going to find more and more things that are hard to exp that appear to be older than the apparent age of the universe. Like these, they find these quasars that are only a few hundred million years old, 700 million years old. And a quasar is basically a, a a galaxy with a big ass, you know, a billion sun masses uh, black hole at the center. And it's hard to come up with a theory that how can you have a galaxy that's done that, collapsed into itself, that's, that has only had 5% of the lifetime of the universe to do that. Um, so anyway, I think they're going to well, find why, a lot. Why would that make the universe older? Well, if you've got a thing in the universe that could, that if a galaxy like that takes, a quasar galaxy takes a couple billion years to form, but you're looking far back in space, which means you're also looking far back in time, and that galaxy is only 700 million years old, it's like, well, that's inconsistent. You've got a three billion year old galaxy that only had 700 million years to form. You have to modify your theory of, of galactic formation. But wouldn't that make that? Wouldn't that mean that the universe was younger, no. not older? No. It would, the farther across the universe you look, the younger you see. So you can see things that are with, within the limits of your observe, of your telescopes and other junk. Uh, you know, you can look. You can look back to ninety-five percent of the. I know. Yeah. Okay. But, but but if the if the if the structures become younger, then no, 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 then it would you, mean the universe was younger. You look back using your telescopes across you know freaking twenty billion light years, and you see a grandma floating in space. It's like, well, wait a second. Everything else in that space should be everything in that space should only be two years old, 
because the universe is only two years old at that time. But here's oh, a 95-year-old oh, grandma oh, okay. floating in a neighborhood that should only be two years old. I see. So it's where you're looking. Yeah. I see. Okay. So anyway, I think that you're gonna, they're going to find more and more of those yeah. things, and then they're going to have to modify the theory and say, well, all right, maybe that wasn't. A, maybe if you've got all this stuff that's older than the universe floating around, then we need a better theory. Mm. And because but have Christmas they found Eve. this? Yeah. Just oh. real quick, it's Christmas Eve, right? It is Christmas Eve. This is our and Christmas Eve special. So do you is do you think that what is your opinion in terms of who created the group? Is there a god that created the universe? Do no. you have an opinion on that? That's Andrew. You go, Lance, and then I'll go. I think God made the universe. I think the universe can't not exist. In that the, the existence, according to most natural ways of thinking, implies an engine of creation. Um, and in science, Things like the conservation laws, that you, the matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Um, people think, well, if it can't be created, then you have to start with nothing, and then something has to step in and cause the creation to happen. Though some people would argue, well, hold on. If we exist now and all this matter exists now and nothing can be created nor dis can matter can neither be created nor destroyed, then well, the universe had to all the matter in the universe had to always exist in some form because hey, the rules. But people don't think that way. They think that you don't, there's no free lunch, and that um, the universe had to start from nothing uh, and something either physics or God, had to make something out of nothing. But there's another way of looking at it, which is that based, a lot of the rules of physics seem to be based on the rules of self-consistency. Only things that agree with the rest of the things that exist in the world can exist. Things that are, something can't exist and not exist, except in a quantum sense that we don't need to go into. Um, and uh, Lance, you say something because I'm about to talk okay. my way into a quarter. It, all right, uh, I'm of the I'm of the view that I mean the first things that the philosophers of ancient times decided was from nothing, nothing comes. So what you know, something had to create the universe. Therefore, it had to be something outside of the universe. Therefore, it had to be a spirit because spirits are eternal and that's why God created the universe. Other, it, 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 that's, that's how it was that it points to there being a spirit to create the universe. Now, you could, you could say that, well, most people say, well, then what created God? But then, but then the, the religious person always says, well, God is a spirit. He isn't created. Uh, things that are spirit are infinite and uh, universal. So I don't have to deal with that issue. But if you are a materialist, you have to explain uh, what created matter. And uh, now you Rick says but, nothing creates Well, it, the deal so is that it can't be created. things that so exist have to be trouble. Things that exist have to exist by virtue of being non-contradictory, non-self-contradictory. Everything has to be consistent. And the rules of consistency are God, such God, I hate that, it when you talk with your hands. Sorry. The rules of consistency are such that you can't rule out existence. There are ways to exist. There, the rules of existence aren't, existence aren't so tight that you get nothing. There's a set of possible existent universes. And we belong to that. Our universe belongs to that set. And nothingness, to the extent that you can talk about the existence of nothingness, no space, no time, uh, no matter, um, is just a, a member of the set of possible things that can exist. And 
the, it's not that you need to start with nothingness. It's that things can't not exist. So do you the, think that man, nothing can be created, nothing can be destroyed. So do you think man cannot be created, we cannot be destroyed, so when we die, we just go into another life form? Because it can't be destroyed. No, I mean, no, because I mean, I'm a materialist to the extent that I think that you know, our consciousness is rooted in the processes that happen in our brain. Um, though you can argue that we can be replicated, our consciousness can be replicated, and especially as we move more and more into the future where we are able to harness the technology to do that, um, people of the future uh, may be able to be technically resurrected, resurrected via technology. Um, and to some crappy extent, people who live at this time in history, there's enough information about us to do a, a half-assed job of doing that. There's an episode of Black Mirror, which you can watch on Netflix, that addresses that, where a character is virtually resurrected via uh, his social media posts, basically. But would I, and I keep saying, well, that's cold comfort because it won't be you. It'll just be your thoughts. Well, it's cold comfort to, for Abe Lincoln, who will be eventually technically resurrected, because there's not enough information about Abe Lincoln to get really close. No, but I mean, but somebody if, who if lives you recorded in, every single second of my life, and then you released me somewhere else, there wouldn't be, it wouldn't be me in two places. It would just be a, a recording of me. I'd be gone if, if I was well, then murdered or something. Well, no, but if somebody, if you stuck your head in some kind of scanner that really that traced every dendritic connection, all the trillions or quadrillions of, of, of connections it in your brain. would then make a copy of me. Yeah. And if well, what, what good does that do me? Well, both of you guys are like, yeah, well, that's me. Yeah, but, but when I get cancer and I'm gone, then it doesn't make me feel good that there's another guy floating around. Well, it, it does if he's got your full experience. And people are going to have to get used to the, the, the apparent paradoxes of replication as we become able to do it in the future. But listen, I want eternal life, pal. Well, you can have it technically. No, I can't have it. You can make a copy of me. That doesn't make yeah, me feel all right, all right. any better. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Damn liberal we'll madness. See. We'll see. All right. What is eternal life to you, Lex? How do you define it? Well, I mean, I, I think that we become reincarnated until we join with God in some sort of perfection. And with that, let's break. And then we'll come back and have a dumb argument about politics. All right.